Good morning, church. It is Sunday morning, and we sure miss seeing you guys, but we are thankful for the opportunity to reach out to one another on the bridge and over social media and things like this. Um, we are thinking about you and praying for you often way over here, and we pray that God is blessing you and that you are doing well way over there. Our text for this morning is Romans chapter 8, starting in verse 12 going down through verse 25. Romans chapter 8, starting in verse 12, going down through verse 25. We want to spend some time thinking about this text this morning. So then, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation. But it isn't an obligation to ourselves to live our lives on the basis of selfishness. If you live on the basis of selfishness, you are going to die. But if you put to death the actions of the body with the spirit, you will live. And all who are led by God's spirit are God's sons and daughters. And you didn't receive a spirit of slavery to lead you back again into fear, but you received a spirit that shows you were adopted as his children. With this spirit we cry, Abba, Father. And the same spirit agrees with our spirit that we are God's children. But if we are children, we are also heirs. We are God's heirs and fellow heirs with Christ if we really suffer with him so that we can also be glorified with him. And I believe that the present suffering is nothing compared to the coming glory that is going to be revealed to us. The whole creation waits breathless with anticipation for the revelation of God's sons and daughters. Creation was subjected to frustration not by its own choice, it was the choice of the one who subjected it, but in hope that the creation itself will be set free from slavery to decay and brought into the glorious freedom of God's children. We know that the whole world, or the whole creation rather, is groaning together and suffering labor pains up until now, and it's not only the creation we ourselves who have the Spirit as the first crop of the harvest also grown inside as we wait to be adopted and for our bodies to be set free. We were saved in hope. If we see what we hope for, that isn't hope. Who hopes for what they already see? But if we hope for what we don't see, we wait for it with patience. In this text, Paul, in his own weird way, is doing a bit of storytelling. And uh, this story that Paul tells is an enormous story that encompasses all of God's creation. The entire cosmos folds it into what God is doing. And as I look at this text this week, and I've kind of been thinking about it, piecing it out, trying to uh, figure out what it means for us, one of the things that struck me is that this story is far bigger than the story we typically tell about God. Um, here I will speak from my experience. I will not pretend to speak for your experience, though it may very well be like mine. But I grew up in a church context where the story was often diminished to a story about me making a personal decision about God that would affect where I went after I died. And it was a very private thing, a very personal thing. And so when I was young, we would go on door knocking campaigns. And I went in door knocking campaigns in a lot of places, a lot of different contexts, but we always began with the same basic sort of question. Uh, we would knock on the door and we would say, and I'm not suggesting this, I'm not saying this is a good idea, this is just what we did. Uh, we would knock on the door, they would open the door and say, uh, could we ask you a question? They would say, sure, you can ask us a question. If you were to die right now, would you go to heaven or hell? I had a couple of people who offered to uh, help me find out the answer for myself, for bothering them at dinner time or early in the morning, those sorts of things. But that's the question we asked. If you died right now, would you go to heaven or hell? And that is the Christianity that I've grown up with. The story Paul tells is much bigger than that. Romans 8, uh, 12 through 25 is basically Paul telling a story, kind of plugging us back into the narrative of God. And the story he tells is inclusive of those individual things. I am certainly a part of that story, and what happens to me after I die is certainly a part of that story, but it's also much bigger than that story. 
It is, in essence, an Exodus story. And if you go back and you spend some time with it this afternoon, you just read over the text slowly and linger over the words and pay attention. Notice the, 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 the Exodus motifs, the Exodus language he uses. God, through his spirit, leading people out of slavery into freedom, that sort of thing. And not only is God leading the people out of slavery into freedom, but he leads, he says in that second part of the text, all of creation he is leading out of slavery into freedom. And that is to say, if you look at it in the sweep of the Bible, that the Exodus story itself was a movement back toward the Genesis story. Genesis 1 and 2, as we've talked about so many times that you probably have dreams about this movement in Scripture by this point, was the time where God made everything he wanted, both the heavens and the earth, and they were as he wanted them to be. And he looks and he saw that they were very good, but they were messed up in Genesis 3 by the entrance of sin and death into the world. The Exodus story is a movement back toward the Genesis story. He was restoring in the people of Israel something of what he had in the beginning of that very goodness of his creation as he promised to fix everything. Israel was the first step in that process and so for instance he leads them out of the chaos and the darkness of slavery into the light and the freedom of a relationship with him. He gathers them around the mountain in Exodus 19 and he says to them that I want you to be my my peculiar people, my prized possession. He says I want you to be in verse 5 of Exodus 19 a royal priesthood and a holy nation. And that language all speaks of, <clears throat> all alludes back to, it all has echoes of the original vocation of humans in Genesis chapter 1. It was a sort of recreation story where Israel serves as a metaphor in their recreation as God's people for what God wanted to do for all of creation, for what God wanted initially for all of creation before sin and death messed it up. And so Israel was a foretaste. They were meant to be that royal priesthood, the ones who in creation in front of the other nations represent God. A token, a sign, a light in the darkness, the Old Testament would use that language, pointing the way towards something better or something more than what we have. And now as we come into the New Testament, Paul speaking to the church that by this time is Jew plus Gentile that has expanded out into a broader category than what it used to be, is starting to encompass the whole world. He says to them, you are now part of this Exodus story. God, as he did in creation, made something very good as he started to recreate an Exodus through God's people, the Israelites, something very good is now expanding that project to all of creation. He is leading not only people out of slavery into freedom through his spirit, but he is now leading all of creation out of slavery into freedom through his spirit. And he says creation itself, this is a great text, beautiful text, says creation itself groans with anticipation. And we groan with anticipation because we are in this story where God is moving, where God is doing something, where God is restoring. And in the story, he would say, we kind of live in between the times. That's where the groaning comes from. There's suffering involved in this story because we live between the now and the not yet. We live between the beginning of the project and the fulfillment of the project. We live in a world in which the dawn is breaking on the horizon, but the night is still there. The new day is coming, but we haven't experienced it in its fullness yet. And so the brokenness of the world is being mended, but the brokenness is still there. We're all at experienced with that. You sprain an ankle, you break a bone, even as it mends, things get better and better and better. And yet you still have to be careful. And so he says that we all groan in the midst of this story. Because even though God is fixing the world, even though we live in anticipation of God fixing the world, even though we live in hope of God fixing the world, the world is not completely fixed yet. 
But he wants to remind us up front, but this is the story. We are a people of hope. We haven't seen the thing in which we hope for yet. Because if we saw it, what would hope be? But it's headed that direction, and we live as a people committed to that reality that God is bringing about. We are the ones to pick up the metaphor of the dawn breaking on the horizon, the ones who turn our back on the long night of brokenness of sin and death toward the rising of the new sun and the new day and say we will be a people of light, not a people of darkness. This is what he means, by the way, when he begins by saying that we are not the ones who live by the flesh, but we are the ones who live by the Spirit. We are not guided by the darkness behind us, but we are following, as they did in Exodus, coming out of the Red Sea and to the Red Sea, the Spirit of God before us. We follow him towards something new. And so one of the things I want us to, to, to just wrestle with this morning is just the grandness of the story. Anytime I start to think about the story in terms of my decision and my fate after my death, I have started to think about the story in terms that are too small for what God is doing in the Bible. Because in the Bible, God made an entire cosmos, and he said it was very good, and the entire cosmos was ruined by sin and death, and the entire cosmos was in his mind when he put that foretaste down in Israel, and that entire cosmos is now in mind even as he is through Jesus and the work he did on his cross and in his resurrection and his ascension, through the work of his spirit leading us into something better. The entire cosmos is in view. God is fixing not just me. He's not just concerned with what I do after I die. But he's concerned with everything, with all of us. And Paul says that in the talk of all of this, um, or in the middle of all of this talk, rather, of freedom, being set free and being guided by the Spirit, he says something very interesting. He starts off by saying that if we are led by the Spirit, if we are God's people, if we are a part of this story actively and loyally so where God is fixing the world, he says if we are in the middle of that, if we have tasted this freedom, there is, the word he uses, an obligation for us. And that's an interesting word because we don't normally think about this in terms of obligations. We normally think about it in terms of gift, but Paul says there is an obligation and he says it's not an obligation to selfishness, it would be a self-centered smallness, only being concerned with me and what's good for me and what I get out of it and what I want and what feels good to me and what I think's right. But he goes on at great length to describe this obligation we have that is all caught up in being led by the Spirit like the people of Israel being led out of slavery by the pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night being led by God out. He says this obligation involves suffering. This obligation involves embodying hope. And as best I can tell... This obligation consists of us who have given our loyalty to Jesus, who have been set free from the brokenness and the slavery of the world, who are being called and led into something different as we move toward the promised land. We are the ones who stand at the meeting point, the point of overlap, a place where the old way of doing things in the darkness bumps up against the new way of God bringing healing and justice and joy and reconciliation. And we stand in that place as those who are still broken, who still sin, who still get things wrong, who still groan in the darkness saying there must be something more than this world we have made. There must be something more than this world I have made. But our other foot stands in the kingdom of God. So we say, I'm broken, but I'm being fixed. There must be something more than this, but we're getting glimpses of it. And standing there at that, that place of confluence where the old runs up against the new, Paul seems to be saying that our job is to stand in that place with one hand reaching out towards those who are broken, one hand holding firmly to Christ and what he is doing in the Spirit, and bringing those two things together. We are 
the hope of the world in that sense. Not that we ourselves are the hope, but we are the ones who embody the hope. We are the beacon of hope. We are the ones who say in our lives, with our very actions, with the way we comport ourselves and conduct ourselves as a community, the way that we love one another and love those around us, the way that we do business, generally speaking, we are the ones who give testimony to the fact that there is something more. And Paul says that even creation looks at those of us who stand in the middle says it, it groans, it waits as a mother giving birth to a child with eager anticipation in what God is doing. And so, um, for some time now, I've toyed with the idea that the surest sign of the health of a church is to look at those places where the community of the church rubs up against the community of the world and see what sort of healing breaks out see what sort of joy breaks out, to see what sort of justice or righteousness or peace breaks out. The surest sign that we have a healthy church is to look at those places where the church rubs up against the broader community and see if the broader community is changed by that. It has nothing to do with whether or not we sing old songs or new songs or what translation of the Bible we use. It has very little to do with many of the things that we fuss or we fight about. The surest sign that we are what we are supposed to be is if there is fruit, visible, tangible evidence in the lives of people around us, and in our lives, that we are standing in the middle, the old world that is groaning and the new world that is dawning and representing hope to those who desperately need it. And so this will look like a variety of things it looks like us loving our neighbors as best we can in the time of a pandemic, taking all reasonable, reasonable and wise precaution to not share a disease that could threaten their lives with them, whether or not it would threaten our lives. Because we have heard the groan come up out of the darkness. And another way of saying this, by the way, is that wherever we hear the groaning, we join in with that groaning that comes out of the darkness. We have heard the groans from the darkness of places like South Texas where my friends face a crisis, or Atlanta, or Arizona. It, it looks like standing with those who own small businesses who are suffering through the economic catastrophe that is 2020 as best we can in wise and creative ways, because they groan as well. Sometimes it looks like being down on broad and lifting our voices with those in whatever way we can lift our voice, with those who groan in the, under the weight of the, the injustice, and the unfairness and the brokenness of the world that comes to bear on them and their communities, listening to their stories, hearing them. And you may have noticed that some of these are very hard to hold in tension. We want to groan with those who are suffering with COVID. We want to groan with those whose small businesses have been shut down by COVID. We want to groan with those who have faced injustice. And that is part of the difficulty. That is part of the beauty, the calling of what we have been called to as the people of God. But wherever the brokenness of the world is expressed, wherever that groaning arises, wherever somebody looks at the world that we have and they say deep in their bones, there's got to be something more. Paul says God has placed his people there at that spot, that, that point of hurt to represent healing, that point of hopelessness to represent hope, that point of mourning to represent grief as we stand with them. And so church, I could go on and on about this point but I'm not going to let me just encourage you to go be the hope of our community this week 
Go be a force for joy and healing and righteousness and justice. And let me just say, I meant to say this earlier, but it's morning. I haven't had enough caffeine yet. That one of the things I love most about the Fernbell Church of Christ is that you are a self-described do-better church. That is, as you have described it in the past, you are the church where people come when no one else will take them and they stay until they can do better. And I know that that is painful, and I know that you guys, and I have shared in this in the last two years, have experienced pain and suffering because of that. And we miss those who have moved on because they can do better. But church, there are much worse callings in the world than being the church that will take the people no one else will take. That is participating in the story of Romans 8. And it is difficult. But God bless you for being that people. Let's pray. God, always make us aware of the story that you are telling. Not only telling, but living out in your action in the world, your work through your spirit, what you have accomplished through Jesus Christ and are accomplishing. Father, we have pledged ourselves to you. So may we be willing and creative and wise and passionate participants in your project of fixing the world. Give us ears to hear those places where the groaning is present. Help us to have the courage to join in that groaning. Give us the wisdom to find ways to point to you as we help the groaning turn to sounds of joy. This is bigger than us, Father. Help us to point towards that bigger thing. And God, may I offer a prayer of thanks for the Fernbell Church. For the ways that they have already embodied this, for the ways that they do embody this. Father, for our family, we give you praise. For every broken life they have taken in over the years, we give you praise. I'm thankful for the hard work that this family does. And now we come and we pray as a family. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory now and forever. Amen. Let's remember who we are as we go back out into God's world. We shall love the Lord our God with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our mind, and with all our strength. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second commandment is like it. We shall love our neighbors as ourselves. All of the law and the prophets hang on these two commands. We love because God first loved us. Anyone who says that they love God but hates their brother or sister is a liar. How are you going to love God whom you have never seen if you don't love your brother or sister who is right in front of you? So this is the command we have from him. Those who love God must also love their brothers or sisters. Church, we love you. We miss you. Have a great week.